I'm in the studio of Claire Gagnon. Close? Yes, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about, we're going to talk a little bit about her school a little bit later. But what I'd like to start with is um, how you got started with art. What were your earliest artistic projects? So believe it or not, my dad saved a drawing that I did when I was three and a half years old. And it's just a scribble. And it says, piece of meat underneath it. And I still have it at home. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember that when I was in middle school, and we had, you know, the, we had the, the, the craft class. And at the end of the year, they always did a small exhibit of all the students' work. And I always won awards. And I thought I couldn't understand why. So that's my earliest memories. I also remember doing uh, a music book, like a sketchbook, um, or a scrapbook, I should say. Every week in music class in little school, we would get a piece of music, and I would, um, I would glue it in my book, but I would also create something uh, that went with the music. So if it was a Japanese, a Japanese piece, then I had it bonsai, a little drawing of a bonsai, or if it was a, a Latin piece, then there was one time I, I drew the guitar and I, I put the notes in in the chords. Well, I cheated. I only put five chords, but anyway. How did you happen to study with Micheline? Micheline Raymond. Raymond, yeah. Yeah. In, uh, in Montreal. In so you were, you were born in and raised in Quebec City. Yes, I was. And somehow you ended up in Montreal. Right. Well, because I, I went to school in IT in Sherbrooke. And when I graduated, I got a job in Montreal. That's how I ended up in Montreal. And then, um, so I was living in Montreal. And in 1996, I thought life was boring uh, with what I had in my life. So a girlfriend of mine and myself, we signed up for painting classes through the city, subsidized classes, very inexpensive. And Micheline was teaching the class. So I liked her teaching and I took two sessions with her. My girlfriend dropped out, dropped out, but I continued. And, um, and then in the spring, there was no classes offered through the city, but she says, I'm offering a class, a drawing class um, in plein air through my private school that she had just opened that year. I thought, okay, I'm going to take that. And then when September came, uh, there was I did sign up through the city, but there was not enough people who signed up for her class. She, she says, if you'd like, you can transfer over to my school. And that's how I started, continued. And I did her whole five-year program, going through every era of painting school. What attracted you? So you, you uh, moved to New England. Uh, what attracted you to New England? I was working in IT for a company who needed someone to come. So I was working in IT for a company in Montreal, and they needed someone to come to Andover for a two-month contract to the Andover office. So I came down. That was in 2000, and I never left. So what, what attracted you to New England, the quality of life or the... The... It was the only offer I got. Otherwise, I would have lost my job back in Montreal. Uh -huh. So I said, okay, I'll do this contract. And then the contract got extended, extended, extended. And oh, eventually they said, uh, you either lose your job or you're transferred to this other office in Andover. I said, okay, I'll transfer for two years. And at the end of the two years, I had my life here. It initially, you know, when I, f the first month I was here, I found the brush. They had life drawing here. I joined the group of artists. I met this group of artists, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed the company. So once once you were here, you continued your studies informally with uh, a number of uh, New England masters. How how did you manage to meet those people? Was it through the brush? Oh, that's a good question. In those days, in those days, I, I'm not sure. Oh. So in those days, we would receive 
newsletters from different art associations. So I signed up uh, to be a member of the art association here at the Brush and also at the Whistler House and at the with the Chancellor Art Society. Because I had met some of these artists in a live drawing group who were part of these associations and they, they, they said, oh, you should go, you should come. That's how I joined. And they would send a newsletter on paper through the normal mail. And in there, there would be ads about this and that and this workshop or that workshop. And that's how originally, I think that's how I found out about certain workshops that I wanted to attend. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it became easy to go online and find these workshops and, you know, the newsletter transferred to online newsletters and snowballed from there. You classify yourself as an impressionist and a realist. What stimulated your interest in those two schools? Well, I'm a perfectionist. And when I do a painting, a rendition of a tree, I want it to look like a tree. And so originally it was like, very, very important for me. And also, you know, earlier on, I wasn't as accomplished as I am now. So I wanted to make sure people believed that this tree looks like a tree or this river looks like a river. So I was very, very intense trying to make sure it was very realistic. And since then, I've been trying to teach myself and also walk through other workshops to loosen it up, to make it more of an impression of what I see rather than a very realistic piece. Although I still do very realistic paintings such as Le Chateau, I like to do more of an impression like the garden there. How did the local artists here influence your, your style or your, or your interests in, uh, in impressionism and realism? Was there any additional influence from local artists? Absolutely. So, <clears throat> for very many years, I went out with Tom Gill. And Tom is a very prolific, very well-known artist here in this area. And uh, he actually showed me how to do a landscape. I never really learned that in art school. Because in art school, it was all about portraits and abstract and not so much about landscapes. So um, I remember there was one time we did a show together, an art in the park show, and we each had a side of the booth. And one of our very good, one of his very good friends showed up and looked at my side and said, wow, Tom, you've been painting much smaller paintings now, but it was my side. Oh, I was so proud. It was like, ooh. But Tom was not so happy about that. <laughs> he did not recognize that this was not his painting. So in those days, my style was very close to what he was, his style was then. Uh, and then I parted from him and I developed my own style. I remember um, painting a painting. Well, we would go places and take photos. And I remember in Kennebunk Port, I said, oh, look at this barn. It's reflecting the, reflecting in the water. It's so pretty. He said, ah, that's boring. Well, I said, I'm capturing this and I'm going to make a painting of it. And I did a uh, 20 by 24 painting, very large. And I showed it at the North Shore Association and I won popular vote. So there. So I, I had, that's, that's my, my way of parting, you know. I had done this. <laughs> Is there anything uh, in particular that inspires your work and your choice of subjects? We were talking a little earlier about the uh, the painting uh, just behind you. And maybe we could talk a little bit about that because I thought the story behind that that subject is very interesting. Absolutely. Sometimes just an object or a concept will spur my my imagination and my creation process so for the painting that you see there which is called dancing cellos uh, it was inspired by a drawing so a friend of mine came to my studio should i name him 
His name is David Faneuf. He has an antique cello. And I did a portrait, uh, you know, I did a drawing of this antique cello. I also did a close-up of the scroll portion of the antique cello. And using this, this was my inspiration to do the piece back there. So uh, if we're talking about the inspiration for this piece, uh, you can see in this piece, which is called Dancing Cello, all of the curves and the lines, they're all part of a cello. When I started this piece, there were actually two scrolls. This is a scroll. So there were two, one here and one here. And um, this one was facing the other way. And this one was facing this way. So they were both facing that way. And at some point I said, well, that one has got to be facing inward. So I changed it to face it, to facing inward. And then I realized it was symmetrical. I had the two, the two scrolls like this. Oh, I can't do this. So the scroll is actually underneath here. If you did an extra of the painting, you would see it. So I painted over this, but and eventually it created this. And if you look very closely, all the lines and all the curves in this painting are part of a cello. So for example, this here, this is the side of a cello. Same thing here, this here. This is and same thing here. And you see another cello here. And so this is a cello, of course. And then the curves here are part of a cello. You can see another one here. And then eventually I did the ribbon to kind of like create, the, create this flow. The other uh, thing that I want to say about this painting is when I started painting it, it was all red and green. And I had dreamed about what I wanted to do here. That's how it started with the two scrolls. But now it doesn't look like anything like my dream, but it was nice to have dreamed about it. Um, but uh, the, uh, the colors that I had started with was all red and green. So this part, instead of being all blue, it was actually facing the other way. It had like red and green, these little parts, each part was separate. And it was very much vibrating because red and green it, are complementary colors. And then every time I came to my studio to continue painting on this, I went, ooh, ooh, that's very impactful. I, it was just too much in my face. And I said, well, it's got to be blue. And so eventually I started making it all blue. It, it didn't, and even this part was all blue. Everything was blue, different shades of blue. And then I, I turned around in my studio and I saw, ooh, I really like that sunset painting that I did there. Let me put a little sunset here or, or a gradation of different colors. So that's why I have this here. I really like this. So then it became alive. So it's all about this. This is the center of attention. This is where complementary colors are. Teal and red orange. Whereas this, although it's a very nice impactful area because the color is more subdued and it's analogous colors then it's the secondary center of interest if i had made this red then the eye of the viewer would say oh should i go here oh no there oh no here oh no there <laughs> and they would get lost it's important for the viewer to have one center of attention where the high contrast is and the very sharp lines are and then maybe there is a second secondary center of interest like here where the colors are more analogous and the lines uh, are maybe less sharp although they're pretty sharp with these lines here but this here the so the viewer enters here and then after visiting here travels here and then it's brought back here so I think it's pretty strong composition. So your classes are a pretty important part of your life right now. Um, how did you get started teaching? Well, first of all, teaching is a passion for me. And this is why when I was uh, 
younger, already I was already working in IT, but at night school at, at a university in Quebec, in Montreal, I went to night school and I did a teaching certificate. So it's like a, an associate's degree. I guess it's the equivalent to, to what you would call an associate's degree here. And, um, and, and so it was how to learn to be a teacher. So I wanted to be a teacher. And um, so when I started, uh, when I wanted to start my art school, I started with uh, private classes that I was offering. So I had one or two students. And also I actually wrote very large grant request to the cultural councils of all towns surrounding Lowell, including Law to request for a grant to offer classes at a lower cost. And these classes were offered, I was offering six classes here at the brush in the lunchroom in the back and six classes at the Arts League of Law in uh, the room in the back as well. And these classes were called Initiation to Painting and I was offering them for half price and uh, basically it was a paint along, painting with a palette knife using primary colors only. And I had great success. Uh, I did get some money from two towns. So not all towns where I requested it, but two towns offered me some money. So um, thanks to those, those, those grants, I was able to do that, offer the, um, the classes for a low price and, and people signed up like very quickly because they were very inexpensive, all supplies were provided and I spent half my time doing promotion. I went to libraries and I, I submitted to different online newsletter and yeah, so that's how I started. So how long has Shea Claire Art School been around? How, how, long, uh, how long ago did you start Shea Claire? Yeah, so I started in March 2018. And so I celebrated five year in business in March 2023 by doing a show with my students right here in, in a room in, uh, at the brush. And the show was a great success. One student even sold a painting. So there were uh, close to 40 pieces in the show. Students were invited to put one or two pieces. And I had drawings, I had watercolor, I had acrylic paintings, uh, a nice, a nice, uh, a nice show, very nice show. Could you summarize the classes that you offer uh, online as well as in person? And I'll put the links to uh, the descriptions. Uh, the descriptions are on your website, and I'll put that uh, as a link in the description of this video. But could you uh, explain to us what the classes yes. are about? Yes. Well, at any time, if someone wants to see what classes are coming up or are being offered, one can always go to my website. You go to the first page on the web website and you'll see there the schedule and then there are links that can guide you through registration process. Um, so I usually offer weekly classes for adults. I, have, I offer two acrylic weekly classes, one watercolor weekly class, and uh, one drawing weekly class. So each session could be either, it could be a different length. So it's either five, six, 10, sometimes uh, 14 weeks of classes. And um, when I open classes, I offer classes to my current students first, then I open to the rest of the public. This is why the drawing class is always full because the current students, they like to continue. So I, I think it's fair to offer them first dibs. Uh, so in my drawing classes, I'll have the students, um, for example, do draw 
um, bottles or sometimes I had them uh, pick from a magazine and do an, an interpretation of something that they see there. And sometimes I will bring them outside to paint in plein air. Uh, last year, I spent the whole year doing portraits. So we started with doing, you know, study of one eye, study of the other eye, and then study of how to do an ear, how to do a mouth, different shapes. And then ultimately we put it all together and we did portraits. Uh, so in watercolor and as well as in acrylic class, I will have the students start with doing a drawing of a simple subject matter. For example, this here, this is my example that I did. It's a vase with a pepper shaker or a pepper grinder. Uh, so a simple subject matter and I'll have the, you know, I have different objects here in my studio to do that. And then um, I'll have the students do a tonal study of the subject matter. So trying to represent here, where's the darkest dark, where's the lightest light, and where's the, the mid-tone. So doing this, this is the watercolor example, um, without white. Ooh, so you have to save the white. And then eventually uh, the students will uh, move on to using the different colors in the color wheel, using two complementary colors at a time. So this example is teal and red orange. So separated in half, one section is uh, dominant, for example, here red orange, the other section is dominant teal. All colors here are made of red orange, teal, or a combination of both. No white. So this is the uh, watercolor example. This is an acrylic example. I do the same thing in my acrylic classes. And this is the example with indigo and Indian yellow. So your classes, uh, they do build on one another. So there's a continuing uh, set of courses so people can start at a certain level and then and then continue with your with your courses and continue to build on their capabilities, their their skills. Yes, yes. So Classes are small. I usually have a maximum of eight students per class. These are classes for adults. And once an adult, uh, a student starts with me, uh, then I try to have them build on to what they did the previous session. And so on a Saturday, it's acrylic for beginners class. So usually it's all beginners in that class. But some of these beginner students now are, have been with me a year or two and so they continue on with uh, the program rather than restarting from scratch every time. Um, same thing in acrylic, uh, in a, the acrylic class on Thursday and the watercolor class on Thursday as well. And in the drawing class, because it's the same group, I have to come up with new stuff all the time. And drawing is a little bit different in the sense that some students are more beginners than others in the sense that they don't have such high skill set so whatever i propose to do there's always like this is a simple way this is the medium way or this is the more complex way i try to challenge the students that i feel have um, more uh, more skills than others but i also offers i still offer the initiation to painting classes with a palette knife and this is an example of such a class with painting the seahorse do you provide materials in the classes or do the students bring their own materials? So in the, in the classes that I call specialty classes, so initiation to painting is a specialty class and I do provide all the supplies. I have classes such like uh, paint like a master. So that's, they paint on larger canvases and it's a, it's a short class, but it's, a, it's not quite a paint along, but I do provide all the supplies because I want all the students uh, to have the same thing available. So, and but in the weekly classes that I offer for acrylic or drawing or watercolor, students have to bring their own supplies. Well, which is a good opportunity to build their, uh, you know, their own stock of materials that they will need to continue their, their work on their own. Yes, so and, also, makes... and also originally I would offer if they wanted to use the uh, the school supplies for a fee they could 
But then when I assigned homeworks, they were unable to do it. So I stopped doing that. Yeah. I want to remind all of our viewers that Claire Gagnon, Gang, Gagnon, <laughs> I will get that Very correct. Good. Yeah. Very good. Gagnon. Uh, she is a member of several local galleries, including the Arts League of Lowell and the Brush Gallery, where we are right now, where she has her studio. Her studio and classrooms are in the Brush Gallery, just up the street from the Arts League of Lowell. For information about Claire's latest exhibits and her website, uh, see her website link in the description of this video. You can also see the uh, list of all of the classes, the current classes that she's offering. So I, I uh, encourage you to go to her website. And so, my upcoming show? Oh, that's right. You have an upcoming show. Yes, uh, I the do. 21st of, starting the 21st of June through... July 16th at the Arts League of Lowell in the Greenwall Gallery. And the opening reception is going to be on Saturday, June 24th. From four to six and that's in 2023 in case you're watching in a future year claire thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you it's been very interesting and informative i learned a lot about your art and your approach and it's uh it's wonderful best of wishes to you with uh, uh, claire uh shea claire. shea claire art school and uh thank you very much and and well Thank you for interviewing me.